morning, CPC. Please stand and join us in song. CPC uh, to this hour of worship of the Lord Christ of whom we've just sung. Uh, our call to worship is taken from the first chapter of Ephesians, I'm sorry, the fifth chapter of Ephesians. Um, hear the word of the Lord. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. But be filled with the Holy Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Pray with me. We who were made in your image, but then redeemed by you, Lord Christ, you who took on flesh like, like ours to ransom us. This indeed, as we've just sung, is a, a wondrous mystery conceived by you before time and brought to pass wholly because of your love. So we come to praise you 
And we imitate you with creativity as we sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. So come and dwell among us, open our eyes, bless our tongues, capture our hearts to the praise of your glory, we pray in Jesus' name. So now crown him with your voices, the Lord of love.
Dear Heavenly Father, great is thy faithfulness. We come before you today in this faithfulness that we can take out into the world. Amen. Everybody, turn to each other and extend the hand of Christ. Good morning, you may be seated. Thank you so much for coming. Welcome to our visitors. Welcome to those who have been coming for a long time. We're so glad to all gather together this morning. My name is Vicki Vandenhuvel and I'm the Director of Children's Ministry and I'd like to hi, um, bring your attention to the bulletin actually. If you could open up the bulletin, there's a tear off insert there and if you are new or you want to find out more about our church or you have a prayer request you can write it on that rip that off and it can go in the offering plate or if the offering plate comes around too soon you're um, welcome to bring that to the welcome desk after the service so um, and also on the back of the bulletin are several announcements that I wanted to draw your attention to today after the service there's a youth lunch that will be in the community room even if you haven't RSVP'd, please come with your family. It's a great time to gather together. Um, May 3 through 5 is the men's retreat. And um, I hear spaces are limited. Is that correct? So that is just, that's a praise. That's very exciting. So that um, Dan Ryan is heading that up. And then VBS is coming up June 18 to 21. I'm just, every year I get so thankful to see the team that God brings together. And this is just, just a, fills me with gratitude for all the way he raises up different people from the congregation and from we partnered with City of Hope and to see all the people br God brings to our team together. I have a couple positions left that I'm looking to fill. One is to head up the games team. I have people for that team. I just need a coordinator to help that team um, take place. Also a person to coordinate the preschool. Our preschool is a small group of kids. It's just for the volunteer kids. It is a sweet group. I've got a great team. I just need someone to help coordinate that. And then also um, one to two people who would be willing to come in the morning from like 8.15 to 9 o'clock to help monitor the um, volunteers' kids while we have a meeting and we get ready for the program to start. So you're just there for a short window in the morning. If those positions sound like something you'd be uh, um, interested in, please see me after the service or you can email me. Um, the other thing I want to highlight that's not in the bulletin is I'm the mother of two college students and I got just very excited to text this week um, from the cards that you all signed and they were so moved by the names on the cards and to you it was just a signature to them it was my church remembers me my church is praying for me I'm seen and I've loved and I know that when I come home my family is here to gather with me so thank you I just you don't all hear the feedback I get little emails from the college kids. And I just wanted you to know how much it means to the college kids from our church that you remembered them and wrote to them. So thank you very much. Let me add my word of welcome to Vicki's. Um, I'm Wayne Koch, one of the elders here, and I want to welcome you now again to uh, Columbia Presbyterian Church. Those who are joining us on the live stream, we're glad that you can do that. and. Uh, can worship the Lord God with us this morning. Our pastor, Bob Birkus, is on his, as he said, first vacation from us uh, out in California for a week, and so we'll be praying for him uh, later on during the pastoral prayer, but uh, uh, in his stead this morning, Elder Dan Ryan will be bringing, opening the word of God to us in a little bit. And so uh, Dan suggested uh, several passages of scripture that are sort of parallels to the one that he's going to be preaching from. And one of those is uh, from uh, Paul's letter to the Romans. And as you listen to this, um, remember that when Paul wrote this, uh, he knew that he was in trouble. 
uh, with the Roman government, and uh, I think he knew at the time that he probably would not survive that trouble, that, uh, that he was um, a condemned man. And yet this is what he wrote in the spirit of the Lord God. Listen to the word of the Lord. Romans 13. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval. For he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer, attending to this very thing. Pay to all what is owed to them, taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, and honor to whom honor is owed. This is the word of the Lord. So as we always do this time in the service, we now go to a time of prayer of confession, and that passage, like I think every passage in Scripture shows me several things to confess, and you too, I think. So let's join together as we um, come before the Lord. I'll leave a moment of silence for you to personalize uh, your confession as we um, come to the throne of grace. Let's pray. Lord, I confess, we confess, we do not like authority. We don't like it as a culture, and as fallen sinners, we don't like it as individuals. We think we'd be better off if we were self-directed, self-actualized, self-promoting than if we submit. Oh, we can get to a place where we remember your authority, your power, your knowledge and wisdom, and we ask for justice and judgment for others. But to submit to another fallen person ourselves that you've put in authority over us, that's a stretch too far. Lord, we confess our sin before you. Father, we remember this week even the times that we've been angry, sullen, stubborn, petulant in the face of authority. Remind us that we can rest in your love as the source of forgiveness. And then help us to feel that love that's the basis of trust that allows us to submit to other people. Remind us that you've put us, we who you love enough to come and die for, you you put us in the places that we find ourselves under the authorities that you've ordained and cause us to see how our obedience to human authority brings glory to you. For that is what we long for, that you would be glorified. And we pray all of this in the blessed name of Jesus. Amen. So our word of assurance is also taken from Paul's letter to the Romans. And if you'd stand, I'll read a very familiar passage to you, Romans 8, 28 through 30. We know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son in order that he might be the firstborn among brothers. 
And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. So glorified sons and daughters of our Lord Jesus Christ, let's sing to him, Be Thou My Vision.
good morning. And thank you all for um, joining us this morning. We're talking today about the closeout of our spring Pioneer Girls ministry. Um, if you're not familiar, Pioneer Clubs is a national organization, uh, and their mission is helping children follow Christ in every aspect of life. Pioneer Girls is our all-girls version of this program that's been running at CBC for decades. Um, so you saw some of our girls up front here with me today. We had a total of 24 girls and 10 leaders in this year's program. Um, we had 10 weeks in the fall and 10 weeks in the spring that will wrap up this coming week. Um, with three classes, our Voyagers, who were all up, some of them up front here with me today, um, is our first through third grade class. They're led by uh, Caitlin here, um, and she's aided by Mackie uh, Newman and Dana Schinholt. Our Pathblazers class is led by um, Andrea, um, and her aides are Susan uh, Bjorn and Stephanie Aldrich. And then our sixth through eighth graders challenger class is led by Christina Rushing, and she's aided by Heather Tatt. Um, so our theme verse, you just heard the girls sing, was Micah 6, 8. Um, and we studied that all through the fall. We wrapped the fall with our annual Christmas party. We had um, some ladies from the congregation join us and talk about how women serve the church um, with their gifts in different ways. So Mrs. Stamps came to talk to us about trustees, and Mrs. Goble came to t teach us about hospitality. Um, we kicked off the spring with a really huge craft night, like decades of old craft supplies pulled out of the closet, do whatever you want, it was fun. Um, Pastor Bob and his wife Carrie came um, and meeting, met the girls during that night. It was a really great time. Um, later in the spring, we had our missions night. Uh, we took on three activities. You can see one of the missions night activities there. The girls are holding up the blankets that they tied during missions night, and those will be donated um, to families with girls about the age of our girls um, who are undergoing various medical treatments. Um, and then we wrote letters to the Loftus family in Kenya because um, they also have a daughter who's about the age of our girls. So we wrote, wrote letters to them as, as a missionary family that the church supports. Um, and this activity was especially personal for me because Matthew and Maggie Loftus volunteered with the college ministry I participated in when I was an undergrad. Um, and he's told me how much his family res appreciates receiving physical mail from the U.S. So that was really special to do and points to one of the things that I value the most about Pioneer Girls, which is that it teaches the girls to be in fellowship with one another, what it is to actually know each other. Yes, Sunday mornings are great. It's a lot of sitting and listening. Pioneer Girls is a little bit more talking to and interacting with one another. Um, and so trying to get them to talking to and interacting with one another across country boundaries was really exciting um, this spring. Um, so we will wrap up this coming Wednesday with our closing ceremony and spring tea party. So please be thinking of us and praying for us on Wednesday as we have tea and do our closing. Um, pra praise God for these 24 girls and then ask him to bless those girls as they go through the summer um, and bring them back to us in next year's program, preparing the hearts of the leaders and the girls who will participate again in the fall. Thanks. Thanks, Emily. Uh, we'll pray for those things in just a moment. I, I apologize for the uh, lumpy transition we just did. I, Emily said, you know, so I just come up and I knew Emily had this down pat, but I didn't know that the girls were going to come up. I could have come and introduced uh, that. But, you know, I love the new format that we have where we have so many different voices from the congregation coming and doing different parts of things. That's, that's um, the way that the uh, Lord's people uh, are together in, in our um, service. And so uh, thank you, Emily, for that and for all who participate in the leadership of Pioneer Girls. Uh, we come now to a time of our uh, pastoral prayer. And so we come to bring petitions uh, to our God who loves us and has given his life for us, put us under authority, and now wants us to thrive as we work together uh, to help um, usher in the kingdom that, that he is bringing. So let's pray. Oh God, we so much uh, do want to be people under the authority of the great king and to see thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so we have um, petitions that we bring to you, the promise keeper, knowing that you love to answer our prayers. And so we do pray for Pioneer Girls. We thank you for these bright young 
faces who are learning the word of God in a way that will stay with them through their whole life. We thank you for their leaders who show them love and who direct them um, toward you. And so we do pray for the um, end of this year and the summer and beginning of next year, you would raise up the leaders that are needed, that you would um, bring um, many to come and participate and that girls would um, remember these things their whole life and uh, um, walk in the way that you are teaching them. Lord, we pray for those who are suffering in the congregation, those waiting for uh, diagnoses, those waiting for treatment plans, those recovering from surgery or from accidents. We all know several people that we can pray for specifically, and so we lift them up to you. We pray for our pastor, Bob, and his wife, Carrie, as they're um, back in California with the three of their children um, going to games and uh, wrapping some things up and taking some time off. And we just pray that that would be a rich blessing for them. We pray for the provision of housing for them here, something that would be um, useful to their service to the kingdom, something that would meet their needs and be in their um, price range. We just long to see you provide for that. We pray for Jeff Brown, who is in his first week in Japan. Uh, maybe the week's been good, maybe the week's been hard, probably it's been both. And we lift him up to you, that you would bless and strengthen him. Be with the rest of the team there in Japan and other missionaries that we love and know and support throughout the world. We just heard about Loftuses in Kenya and others. And we commit them all to you. Lord, on this week when we are thinking about authority, we do pray for our government, local, statewide, national, for governments around the world. We see the news. We know that governments make very bad decisions and launch things at one another and create turmoil uh, for people who are innocent. We thank you for the government that you've given us and pray that you would give wisdom, virtue, imagination, love to leaders, that they would lead in the way that you have shown that authority should lead. Help us as we submit to them and as we support them in their duties and responsibilities, even as we support them now in prayer. And so we thank you that you are the king, the Lord of the entire world. That all of these things from the smallest to the biggest is not too small and not too big for us to bring to you, God. And ask that you would fulfill your purposes, that you would bless your people, that you would build your church, that you would make great your name. And we pray all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen. And now, uh, children age four uh, to second grade, if your family is chosen, uh, you can go to Children's Church. Uh, volunteers will meet your children out at the Welcome Center. If you're a visitor, you're welcome to take them out there and uh, meet the people that will be with them in this hour. Um, and if the ushers would come forward. We're going to pray again. Tithes and offerings are not taxes. We're going to hear about taxes. Sometimes it might feel like that, but we've just prayed for all the things that the Lord is doing in the world, and we want to see those things take root and, and blossom, and our tithes and offerings are a precious opportunity for us to do that. We do that together in the service because it's not just me and what I put in the basket, it's all of us and what we do together that the Lord uses because he's called us as a people and so whether you're um, using the uh, codes that we have, which we think we've gotten fixed, we heard there were some glitches, or whether you're um, putting something in the basket, let's pray now that the Lord would bless our tithes and offerings to him. Lord God, we thank you that we can participate. We thank you that you own the cattle of a thousand hills and don't need what we bring, and yet you condescend to use it. And so we, we thank you that uh, we can worship you this hour in this way.
bless our gifts that we're given. In Jesus' name, amen. stand and join us in the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly hosts. Praise church. For those who may not recognize me in a suit, my name is Dan Ryan. I'm one of the elders here. This is only the second time in the last six years I've worn a suit, and so yesterday my wife lovingly suggested I try it on. I don't know, don't know why she did that. Anyway. All right, so as I was thinking about what passage to present today and talking with Bob about it, we looked at the calendar and realized that tomorrow was tax day, all right? And between that and the looming election this November, we thought it a suitable time to study what Jesus says about government and our relationship to it. Now, be honest with me. Who got nervous just now? Anybody? One, just one hand, honestly? All right, I'm nervous. Okay. Well, government is a divisive topic, isn't it? We have, we have a lot of recent trauma from everything that's been happening, and... Uh, though that's challenging, I thought it was actually uh, a suitable time because the divisiveness we experience in our current culture actually helps us appreciate what Jesus' audience was going through then. Government was just as divisive then as it is now, maybe more so, and yet Jesus did not shy away from it, but rather he spoke full of truth and grace and love, and he showed his followers not only how to relate to a government, but also how we should relate to any authorities in our lives, which is why I've titled the talk as I have. So let's look at what Jesus says about this critical area, but first, pray with me. Lord God, it is a blessing to be here. Thank you for this time. I pray you would bless the reading of your word and the preaching that follows. And so far as it is faithful to you and who you are and helpful, would you grant us ears to hear. In your holy name, amen. Do you think Bob will mind that I modeled that prayer after his? It was pretty much a direct copy if you pay attention. Anyway, so Matthew 22, 15 to 22. 
Then the Pharisees went and plotted how to entangle him in his words. And they sent their disciples to him, along with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are true and teach the way of God truthfully, and you do not care about anyone's opinion, for you are not swayed by appearances. Tell us then what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why put me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. Then Jesus said to them, Whose likeness and inscription is this? They said, Caesar's. Then he said to them, Therefore render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. When they heard it, they marveled, and they left him and went away. So we'll start today with the context of this passage, followed by some reflections on authority. Now, a coin in context. The Bible's truths are universally applicable. They apply across all cultures, all times, all peoples. But the Bible was written in a specific time to a specific people. And it is important to understand the context of that to appreciate its universal applicability. There are things we can miss or misinterpret when we don't appreciate the context. So that's why we start there today. So Jesus is in Jerusalem. He's in the temple. He's preaching. He's actually, this is three days before he will be crucified, okay? This is his final public teaching before his crucifixion, and his sermon is captured in the final verses of Matthew 21 all the way through Matthew 23. Now, Jerusalem is in Judea, which is one land in a broader region of Palestine. We need to rewind a bit to when Jesus was born. There was one man in charge of this entire area. His name was Herod the Great. He was not great morally, but he was great. He controlled a great territory, and he ruled that as a client state to the Roman Empire. A client state means that he paid tribute once a year in return for some protection from Rome. Now, when Herod died, he decided in his will to split his kingdom four ways. He gave it to his sister and three of his children. All right, this was actually mentioned last week in Luke 3, if uh, you noted that when Bob was talking about that. It's called the Tetrarchy. All right, so this created four client states to Rome. The client state that w included Jerusalem was Judea, and his son, Herod Archelaus, was appointed ruler of that territory. Now, Archelaus' mother was a Samaritan. The Jews and Samaritans did not get along very well. And, in fact, Archelaus would prove a disastrous ruler, so much so that in 6 AD, Roman, uh, the, the empire deposed him, and they decided to make Judea a direct Roman province. So now you have three client states and one direct Roman re, uh, rule in that area. When Rome took control, they imposed the poll tax. That's the tax that, that is mentioned in this passage today, and we'll talk more about that in a moment. But now we're going to fast forward back to the present time of the passage, and we need to talk about the two people, the two groups of people that ask Jesus this question. They are the Pharisees and the Herodians. Now, both of these groups were people who sought political independence for the Jews, <coughs> excuse me, but for different reasons. The Pharisees are well understood by most of us. They're mentioned often in the Bible. They were teachers of religious law. They had <coughs> religious authority. And they interpreted the Old Testament prophecies to mean that the Jews would return from exile, which had happened, and that they would be restored to self-rule, which had not. They wanted Jewish self-rule. The Herodians were loyal to the family of Herod. They were called partisans, meaning strong supporters of Herod's family. They wanted to see one of Herod's line put back in charge of Judea, returning Judea to a client state status. They wanted to be rid of direct Roman rule too, but for a different reason. Okay, now back to the poll tax. Because Judea was under direct Roman control, they were subject to this to be paid once a year and it required to be paid with a denarius. Would you please show that coin? Thank you. This coin has Caesar's image and it has an inscription. If you looked at the left, the left image there, the head side of the coin starting at the six o'clock position and you read counterclockwise, I'll translate it to the English, uh, it says Tiberius Caesar Augustus, sign of the divine Augustus. And on the reverse side of the coin, it says high priest. All right, so Tiberius was calling himself the son of God and high priest. You understand why this would have upset the Jews? Right? Anybody see that? Yep. All right. It was highly offensive to the Jews. Not only was it a symbol of subjugation, it also blatantly blasphemed. 
it called Tiberius the son of God and high priest. Who is the son of God and high priest? There we are. Yeah, yeah, good. Rome knew it offended the Jews, and thus they had granted a concession. They did not require the Jews to use this in their everyday interactions. They had copper coins without this offensive component for that. But once a year, for the poll tax, they were required to use a denarius. Even this concession was not enough for the Jews. In fact, when they imposed a poll tax in 6 AD, a man named Judas of Galilee had revolted. He had recruited some followers. He had tried to overthrow Roman control. It failed. He was killed. His followers scattered. That's actually mentioned in Acts 5, if you uh, remember that. And uh, though his rebellion was put down, there remained a group eager to see Jewish independence. They were called the Zealots. And so even years later, here at the time of Jesus, tensions were high. So with this context in mind, you can see why the question was a trap. The Pharisees were against the tax, wanting Jewish self-rule. The Herodians, while not in favor of the tax per se, they wanted to placate Rome enough so that they, their family, would be restored to rule of that region. Either way, Jesus answers, he will be viewed either as a traitor to the Jewish people or as inciting rebellion against Rome. So this question goes well beyond, should I pay a tax? But it's this question about how we submit to government and earthly authorities. How would Jesus respond? His answer was twofold. First, he says to render to Caesar what is Caesar's. Here he is showing both the legitimacy of government in general and the validity of a pagan civil rule over God's people. When he says what is Caesar's, using this language, he's showing that government has a valid place in society. And we see the seeds of this all the way back in Genesis 1, before the fall. We read in chapter 1, verses 27 and 28, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Now, many of you know this passage is called the cultural mandate. To have dominion over every living thing implies the need for a lot of things, one of them being government. You need structure to bring, Jesus, to bring God's command here to fruition, right? And that, that is why we know government is legitimate, and it's had fleshed out more in various passages throughout Scripture. Wayne read one this morning. Uh, in Romans 13, you recall it said, let every person be subject to the governing authorities. Remember, there is no authority except from God. And therefore, we are to give to all what is owed them in their various positions of authority. And then in 1 Peter 2, we read, Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution. So we see from these passages that government is from God. It has a purpose. Broadly, that purpose is for our good, for justice, and that we be subject to it and honor those in it accordingly. That's why Jesus' language here in the Greek is to give back to Caesar what is Caesar's. The questioners ask a, use a different word. They said, should we give taxes to Caesar? Jesus answered, give back to Caesar what is Caesar's. And further, with his answer, he's showing that not only is authority from God, that is true even when the authorities themselves do not follow God. And this is true not just for civil authority. In fact, in a humbling way, in the very next chapter, in Matthew 23, verses 1 to 3, we read the following. This is the same sermon he's preaching. Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, the scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat. So do and observe what they tell you, but not the works they do. For they preach, but they do not practice. He proceeds to turn to the scribes and the Pharisees and pronounce seven woes on them. That must have been an awkward sermon, right? So people are to submit to them due to their position as religious authorities, even though they are terrible leaders. They are not doing what they're supposed to do. They are not modeling God's ways for the people. Nevertheless, the people are supposed to submit. This is a religious authority, not civil, but the same concept applies here, and thus we can safely extend it to every authority in our lives. Our submission to the authorities in our lives does not depend on their obedience to God. Now, there's an obvious caveat here, one I'm sure that's on your minds, is when the authorities tell us to disobey God, then we disobey them, right? 
In Acts 5, the apostles were arrested for teaching about Jesus. They were brought in, and the high priest reminded them, saying, we strictly charged you not to teach in his name. And how did Peter and the apostles respond? We must obey God rather than man. It is God's command about earthly authority that dictates our submission to that authority. So when those earthly authorities demand we go against God, we disobey, and we bear the consequences. Sometimes Christians and the government can coexist peacefully without problem, and sometimes we cannot. And in sometimes, in some ways, weirdly, it might even, we might even see both, and we have a wonderful example of this in Daniel. Not me, the Old Testament book, right? If you read the first six chapters of that book, you'll see that Daniel and his friends are part of the exile. They were raised in Judah when the Babylonians invaded in around 586. They were carted off to Babylon. They were raised in the court of Nebuchadnezzar to serve him, and they do. They serve that pagan authority with excellence and love. And sometimes the government honors and promotes them, and sometimes the government tries to kill them, right? Talk about a hostile work environment, right? The point is, no matter what happens to them, they seek the good of those authorities, and the only time they cross them is when those authorities tell them to bow down to an idol. They disobey the government in that case, um, and they deal with the consequences. So we can summarize. Across all authorities God appoints on earth, we are to obey their lawful commands, meaning those that conform to God's law, in their sphere of authority. And I hope this is intuitive, but government in civil matters, yes, but I would recommend against going to the government for advice on how to balance your budget, right? Uh, parents when you're in their home, referees and coaches when you're on the field, bosses at work, and so on. Right? Outcomes will vary in this world. As Wayne mentioned with Paul and the Romans, Jesus is not saying here that obey and everything will be great. He's saying obey. They might kill you. He, tells, he talks to the uh, disciples in just a few chapters after this about the tribulation they are going to face. It doesn't matter. Submit to them. We should submit to the fallen authorities in our lives because doing so is ultimately submitting to God, who is our ultimate authority, and leads me to the next point. Now, since the initial question was about government, it's easy to miss Jesus' second answer here in this response. He says, render to God what is God's. What is God's, and why would Jesus add that to the answer? They didn't ask that question. Well, let's continue using the approach Jesus used in answering the first part. He argues in this passage that image is indicative of ownership. The coin belongs to Caesar. The coin bears Caesar's image, so it belongs to him, and therefore you should obey him. So that leads us to a question. What bears the image of God? We do. Me, you, even my in-laws, right? Every single one of us. Jesus' weightier point in today's message is that we belong to God and we owe him everything. The scriptures are full of verses to this effect. I'll just read a few. Remember that the earth is the Lord's and everything in it in Psalms. Everything in this world is God's, not just us as image bearers, but everything else. We belong to God and are subject to him. You are not your own, we read in 1 Corinthians 6. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God in James 4. We are to subject ourselves to his will for his glory, and we are to say, not my will, but yours be done, as we read in Luke 22. It's why we are called, as Wayne read earlier, to be imitators of God and try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him, in Colossians 3, and we are even commanded to take every thought captive to obey Christ, in 2 Corinthians 10. So bringing our lives under the lordship of Christ is a key step in our maturity as believers. It's common for new Christians to think, well, what does God require? Well, I'm going to obey the letter of the law, the Ten Commandments, you know, do not murder, do not lie, do not steal, and things those are very good things to obey. These are absolutely part of being a Christian. But the real, the brunt of Christianity is obeying the spirit of that law, which Jesus spells out later in Matthew 22, which is to love God with everything you are and love your neighbor as yourself. To submit yourselves to the Lord's lordship in every area of our life. And doing so requires submission in everything we do, we think, we say, 
And it is our submission to God as the ultimate authority of our, in our lives that drives our submission to the derivative authorities in our lives that he appoints over us. And we can take comfort in this reality that God is sovereign. He tells us in Proverbs that the king's heart is a stream of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he will. And in John 19, when Jesus is brought before Pilate, shortly before his crucifixion, we're reminded of God's sovereignty. So Pilate said to him, you will not speak to me? Do you not know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? Jesus answered him, you would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given you from above. We can submit even to evil people, evil authorities in our lives, knowing that God is ultimately in charge of everything. And he shows us that even that what man intends for evil, God can use for good, as he showed us in Genesis 50 with the story of Joseph. That doesn't make it easy, though. Why is authority so challenging for us? We have a problem with authority. In today's passage, Jesus saying, render to God what is God's, is not only a foundational principle. I believe it's also a rebuke. Jesus calls the Pharisees and the Herodians hypocrites here, I think for two reasons. But their question carries with it a pretense of piety, doesn't it? They ask, is it lawful, meaning does it accord to God's law, that we pay taxes, right? They seem to care what God's law thinks. But do they? First, they were able to produce a coin that they supposedly disdained and needed only once per year to pay the poll tax. Why would they have it on them if they hated it? And secondly, their question implied that it was the government's disobedience to God that made it hard to submit. Jesus' reminder to us about submitting our lives to lo the Lord in every way is pointing to us the fact that we don't do this. We don't submit to the perfect and ultimate authority, God. So Christians, the problem isn't that the authorities God calls us to submit to are sinful. The problem is that we are sinful. We reject authority, both fallen man and holy God's. It was the original sin. Adam and Eve wanted to be like God. They rejected God's authority, and they sought to become their own. And we do the same. Every time we sin, we are saying, you do not know, Lord, what is best. I am the right person to decide that. I am my own authority. That's what we say whenever we sin. It's no surprise, given our fallen nature, that in a 2021 survey, 46% of Americans admitted that they think they are, quote, better than everyone else they know. <laughs> right? At first glance, that seems shocking, doesn't it? Right? Half of Americans think they are the best person they know. But when we think about what it means to be fallen, to, be, to reject authority, it makes complete sense. If you reject every authority but your own, then you are the best person you know, right? I guarantee you, friends, you do not want me in authority. There'd be eagles' flags everywhere, right? So anyway, can you think of ways that you reject God or man's authority? It may not be evident, but there's an easy way for us to identify this. How we handle authority is what we do when we disagree. When we disagree with the authorities in our lives, and there's any number of things we might do. We might fight with them, we might flee from them, we might ignore them. Um, some quick examples, fighting authority, pretty obvious. Any parent out here with children knows what that looks like, right? Fleeing authority, we often think some people go from uh, job to job, from church to church, uh, from club to club. They're, whenever they have disagreements, they seek to get out from that situation. Right? They don't want to submit. They try to seek this authority that basically agrees with them all the time. Right? Uh, and we see this, it, you cannot escape authority. No matter how high you go in any organization, you are always under authority. A few years ago, my, my dad was a history teacher for decades, and he had a student who just chafed under this concept. He said, I am so sick and tired of people telling me what to do. I can't wait to get out of school and join the army. I'm glad you enjoyed that as much as I did. Boot camp, <laughs> boot camp must have been a delight for him, right? <laughs> right? We can never escape the reality of authority. And we, we, we also ignore it. People ignore it. How many people know Thomas Jefferson? Not personally. Or they know of his Bible, right? The Thomas Jefferson Bible, he decided that he would cut out from the Bible everything he didn't agree with. All right? 
and the result was the Thomas Jefferson Bible. So we can say with confidence that who was Thomas Jefferson's authority? Thomas Jefferson. He was his own authority. He decided what part of God he would believe and what part he wouldn't, meaning in the end that he followed himself. Sometimes, and that brings up a good point, sometimes we mi mistake agreement for submitting, but the key here is what do you do when you disagree with authority? That reveals the truth. And I'll say that our problem with authority has another facet. Remember in Genesis 1 where God makes us in his image, and he also gives us all a command to have dominion. That means that every single one of us, in fact, is an authority, whether you have a title or not. We routinely uh, forget this, and we misuse and neglect the authority the Lord has given us. We misuse our authority, seeking selfish gain or proud domination of those in our charge, and we neglect our authority. We don't develop or use the gifts that he has given us to foster shalom, that universal peace, that wholeness and flourishing that he commands us to when he says love our neighbor. In sum, our problem with authority is that we reject it in others, both fallen man's and perfect God's, and misuse or neglect our own authority. So where do we go from here? As Bob said last week, the answer is always repent. We need to think differently about authority. We need to learn how to submit to God, how to submit to others, and how to rightly exercise our own authority. And thankfully, we have a beautiful picture of how to do this in Jesus, who came not just to redeem us, but also to restore us, to show us the way things are supposed to be. So how does he model authority? Well, we can't be exhaustive, but we can show you a few things. He submits to earthly authorities. He honors his parents, as Bob mentioned a few weeks ago. He pays the temple tax in Matthew 17, even though he tells Peter, he's like, I'm a son. I am God's son. I don't need to pay this, but I am going to. And we know he was mistreated. He saw Caesar's coin, and yet when he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When suffered, he did not threaten, but he continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly, as we read in 1 Peter. He also submits to God, and we can forget this. Jesus is part of the Trinity, and yet he submits to God the Father. He reminds us in John 6 that, For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who set me. And in the Garden of Gethsemane, shortly before his arrest, he prays this, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And as to his own authority, well, how did he use it? Jesus came not to lord his authority over us, but to serve. As we see in Matthew 20, verses 25 through 28, Jesus called to them, the disciples, and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you. Whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be your slave. Even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. We have that same charge. We read in 1 Peter, as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. And so we see, like Wayne read in the liturgy today, that even exercising authority in, involves submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ, as we read in Ephesians 5. So submitting to authority is not just submitting up. It's submitting down. It's submitting side to side. And we have many pictures of this in our lives. Authority is interdependent. Uh, we need each other. I'll give you a few examples of this. Uh, many of you know Elevate, our basketball program. Well, this past year, I was watching one of my children. I won't tell you who, but um, my only daughter, as she was playing, <laughs> and uh, Michael was the ref, right? And Michael's the authority on the court. Well, the ball goes out of bounds. Michael doesn't see who it went out on, and he tells them that. He's true. He wants to be a just authority. He said, I don't see who last touched that. Would somebody please tell me? And my daughter said, I touched it last. And he said, thank you. He gave the ball to the other team and play proceeded. I was so proud of her in that moment. Prouder than any points she scored that year, and she scored a lot. Uh, she's, <laughs> she doesn't get that from me. Uh, but see, that's an example of how authority is interdependent, and it works. Michael is in charge the whole time as a referee, but he needs the people to be true because he can't do it all on his own, right? 
And here's another example. How many people do you think are in authority at a given worship service? A lot. You know, a lot. I, I'm not even going to be able to include anyone, I, I, or everyone. I'm sure I'm going to miss people, and I apologize for that. But you think about the people involved on any given Sunday. You have your hospitality team that's setting up the coffee. You have people setting up the chairs. You have the music team. You have the sound team. You have the uh, children's church teachers. You have the nursery workers. You have the liturgists. You have the pastor. In any of these, every single one of those is an authority over that sphere, but they need the other authorities, and they need to submit to the other authorities to make that work well. It's a beautiful picture when it works. And in fact, it should drive us to our knees. Rightly understanding authority, both submitting to it and exercising it, drives us to the Lord. It's not, look who I am, but Lord, who am I? As we read in the Psalms 8, verses 3 through 6, When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. The Lord has granted us dominion in our lives. He's granted authority both to us and to others, to governments, to religious, to your parents, everything. And the point of all of those authorities is to submit to each other and glorify the Lord. Now, as I conclude here, I just wanted to be clear, this is not an exhaustive look at authority or God and government. I could have said more. You may wish I had said less. But let's conclude the passage today noting something. The crowd marveled. They recognized that not only had Jesus evaded a trap, but he also gave them powerful principles, and he showed that his focus was completely different from their own. It is ever our tendency to focus on earthly authority. Who is in charge? Who's going to win the election? Et cetera, et cetera. The disciples were worried about that same thing. We read in Acts chapter 1, when they, the disciples, had come together, they asked him, resurrected Jesus, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? So let me pause for a second and paint that picture. Jesus has died and come back to life, and they're asking him, when will you give us the kingdom, right? That was on their minds. Our minds are ever on the things of this world. But how did Jesus answer? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. So we are empowered. We are granted great power to be witnesses. Why? Because that's where the real power is. Only Jesus can change our hearts. And we remember that, as he says in Romans 10, faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. He empowers us to be witnesses, people hear, and he brings people to faith. That is real power. And, jo and Jesus reminds us in John 18, as he's talking to Pilate, he answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews, but my kingdom is not from the world. And so too, we are to seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. So all this is to suggest that if you want to see the Lord's name proclaimed in America and you want, to feel, you want to see his influence spread, love your neighbor. Submit to God and to each other. Use your own authority to serve others. It is not our vote, but our conduct, our ways and our words. That is the weightier witness to this weary and watching world. And he reminds of the, us of this in John 13. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. So may the Lord show us how to render to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. And may we take comfort in knowing that regardless of who holds these earthly thrones, Jesus sits on the heavenly one. He is putting all things under his feet. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end, as we read in Isaiah, and he promises us that he is making all things new. Amen? Let's pray. Lord God, we have a problem with authority. Where we confess, Lord, that we do not submit to, we do not want to submit to 
any authority in our lives, whether yours as holy gods or our colleagues and those you've put in our charge over us in fallen man. Lord, I pray you would forgive us for this and forgive us for how we misuse and neglect our own authority, Lord. I pray you would bless us to learn how to submit to your glory and the delight of each other. In your holy name we pray, amen. Please stand and join us in our final, final song. He will hold us, hold me fast. application questions in your bulletin. I didn't cover those in the talk because those are for your personal consideration or if you're in your community groups studying those. 
Uh, you can ponder them then. But friends, hear the closing words from Jude. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Go in peace.